Torah Life Ministries come out of the world. Messiah people seek the truth. Hello everybody, it's Paul Neitz from Torah Life Ministries. We are here at the conference and we're just meeting some great speakers. And this next person I'm going to interview, I've read his books uh, over and over again. Gave them out to so many people. And it was just a great surprise to hear he was going to be here. And I got to meet him. He's one of the most popular people here. And I'm so glad we got to sit down and talk. We're going to talk about his books and a lot of things. His name's Andrew Gabriel Broth. If you haven't heard of him before, you have to and you must. Uh, great information, and here's the interview right now. So tell us, uh, you know, people think often that uh, the scriptures, they say we, it, was, it was originally written in the New Testament in, in, in Greek. Uh, but your book seems to say, or your teaching seems to say, no, it was originally in Aramaic, not Greek. That's the New Testament. Correct. And uh, so can you talk about that a little? Well, sure. I mean, this is the core of what I teach. Uh, this, is, this is the short version. If we can talk about the Greek going back to the second century, you know, and I know that it does, and I can find places, let's say, oh, I don't know, 600 of them, where there was a mistranslation into Greek that could only have happened in Aramaic, then the source of, that got mistranslated from must be older. So with the camel and rope that I just described, the only way that makes sense is if there is an Aramaic written original with G-M-L-A on there. If it was oral, they would have heard the vowels. They would not have made that mistake. And so, therefore, however old the Greek is, and yeah, I love it because it's a great friend when I need it, it ultimately bows down to its Semitic master. Which, by the way, so does the Septuagint on the Old Testament side, the Greek translation of the Tanakh. Now, are there any written versions of the old... What's the oldest Aramaic written version known? For the, for the New Testament, well, there is, there's, we're still studying this, but I will say that the Kaburis manuscript has a bookmark. All Aramaic manuscripts have something called a colophon. And this way you don't have to guess, you know, based on rough script styles over a per certain period of time. The bookmark will tell you who made it, where it was made, and the year. The colophon for Kaburis says made, that it was a copy of, of something that was made 100 years after the Great Persecution. Now I want to tell you what I'm going to say is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of the people who are the custodians of the Kaburis manuscript right now. And they've published their findings that that means the first persecution of believers under Nero. So if Nero persecuted those believers in the year 64, after Rome burned, that means Caborus is a copy of, of something from 164 of the Common Era. And if, if people will debate that, in a sense, because sometimes the pages wear out and they get replaced, so they date the older pages. But we have full codices, certainly by the 4th century. And that's basically what you're looking at with the Greek. If we're really, really fair... When you get a little fragment that says, what is truth, or chi, the most common word in the Greek language, and you date that to about the year 125, but in terms of full books, collections being put together, the full canon, you're looking at the 4th century there, and you're looking at the 4th century for the Aramaic as well. So let's compare apples to apples. And you made a great translation uh, of the New Testament, and you're working on uh, the original covenant now. Now, uh, what's your opinion uh, about the Lamza translation? Uh, well, it depends on what we're talking about. Uh, first, let me explain who George Lamza was. Uh, George Lamza was uh, a member of the Church of the East who had, has preserved the Aramaic, both, both covenants, and he uh, did a New Testament translation that is highly controversial because he allowed certain liberal beliefs to infect his translation. To give one example of that, he didn't believe that demons existed. So when the Aramaic clearly says Shaida or Dewa, you know, which is similar in Hebrew of the words for demons, he goes, they were, they were lunatics, they were crazy instead. This is why the Church of the East threw him out, <laughs> rejected his translation. But they start, seem to have a good amount of interest in my translation because they know that I have corrected that and put it back in the original idioms. Okay. Now, for the Old Testament, though, I want to give Lamza his due. Um, and, you know, a lot of people came to Aramaic primacy through Lamza's New Testament translation, so it's been helpful in that sense to give them, to get them used to the ideas. 
his Peshetta Tanakh is way, way better than his New Testament translation. And at this hour, it is the only full Aramaic to English Tanakh translation in existence. So for that, I think Lamza deserves a lot of credit. Uh, and I use his, his English version of the Tanakh every day. So you know Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek? Yes. Did you, very, did you grow up with these, or did you learn these in college later on? How did you learn all three languages? Well, what, what happened was that, you know, I'm, I'm raised Jewish, first of all. Went to Hebrew school just like everybody else in Long Island, New York. And um, so I loved Hebrew from an early age. To let you in on a little clue, I was a bit challenged developmentally growing up. So my peak lear language learning period wasn't at age two or so. It was around between the ages of four and five when I was just starting to talk, and that's when I was in Hebrew school, which sort of ended up being kind of an advantage after I got over the idea that I, should, I shouldn't write English right to left and Hebrew left to right and all these other things that happened. But it did eventually sort itself out, and I just always loved Hebrew. And as I studied, I became more uh, interested in Aramaic growing up because I realized this was a language that was all over my Jewish history. This is before I became a believer. And yet, um, what had happened was that um, it was being hidden by Hebrew letters, which actually aren't really Hebrew letters, but that's another story. Now, fast forward to my college years. Um, I got convicted that Yeshua was the Messiah, and I didn't know what to call myself. And so I began studying Greek in college. Um, but then I kind of stopped because I saw, I, when I could read it, that Kurios was used as, as a name for Yahweh, and that's also used for Zeus. I said, touch not the unclean thing. I don't even want to deal with it. So I dropped my Greek studies uh, at that particular point. Uh, and then I almost lost my faith until I discovered that the Aramaic New Testament Renewed Covenant had been preserved. And once I got a look at this, everything made sense. I had been actually a bit of an anti-missionary for a while, and I had a lot of fun poking holes in the Greek, you know, uh, things that were not Torah accurate, lepers having dinner parties, uh, you know, eunuchs worshiping in the temple. I had a ball with, the, with those things. And every single issue that I had was corrected in the Aramaic. And so that was a renaissance for me, and I've been looking at the Aramaic ever since. And how did you go from being a, a young Jewish boy in New York to believing in Yeshua Messiah? <laughs> Practice! <laughs> uh, I, I guess it was something that came on rather gradually. Uh, when I was in college, there were uh, you know, various people, Campus Crusade for Christ and all this sort of stuff that were trying to convert me. And um, what, it, what had happened was, they, at one particular meeting with the Triple C, as I used to call them, they said, Andrew, I have a Christian rabbi just waiting to meet you. And I said, great, I have a square circle in my pocket. Congratulations, mazel tov. Uh, but I, w I, met, I went to this meeting with him, and he gave me his book, which was called The Olive Tree Connection. He was a guy by the name of John Fisher. And I began to read, and I began to, you know, people began to say, well, we'd like your perspective on the Hebrew, which was interesting because I was expecting them to ram their Jesus down my throat, and instead what they were saying is, could you please explain this, this prophecy in Tanakh? I can't quite make it out, you know, bat their eyelashes, and I was like, oh, these people are clever. Um, and the more they pointed out to me, the more I began to realize that he had to be the Messiah and the Savior. But they weren't going to ram Isaiah 53 down my throat. I mean, we had enough training to be able to just go... Ping, you know, no worries with that. What really got it for me was, was Zechariah, uh, and particularly Zechariah 6.12, where his name was foretold 500 years in advance. And I was like, how can you possibly deny that? And it, then, then I fell on my knees and I gave my, my life to Yeshua. Wonderful information, Andrew. Please give everybody your website where they can contact you and get your wonderful books. Okay. Well, for the Aramaic English New Testament, it's www.aent.org. And we also have a, a, a sister site uh, for the Wheel of Stars, uh, www.wheelofstars, one word, no breaks, dot com. And also uh, Hebrew New Testament dot com. So uh, those are the main ones. Wonderful. 
All right, everybody, there he was, Andrew Gabriel Roth. Get his books, get his information, go to his website. You'll be glad you did. And if you have any questions or comments, post them below the video. Until then, have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Seek the truth, avoid the evil. Learn Yahweh's way.